In the Danish city of Aarhus, young demonstrators gather to call for immediate action to tackle climate change. The rally in Denmark's second biggest city is part of a global movement called Fridays for Future and comes ahead of May's key European elections. It's going wrong that the politicians, the world society, they signed the Paris Agreement three years ago, but they don't live up to it. They have no plans on how to reach the goals. And that's why we're here on the streets today. Climate change is one of the biggest concerns for many voters in Europe and a hot topic ahead of next month's European poll. Leaving Oos, we head to Samsa. The Danish island has become a poster child when it comes to fighting climate change. A world leader in sustainable energy, Samsa achieved 100% power independence in less than five years thanks to a community-wide commitment. The adventure began when Samsa won a national contest to create a strategy that would reduce CO2 emissions. This ferry was part of the master plan. We are on route to Samsø. The island is famous across Denmark when it comes to the issue of mitigating climate change in a big way. The Princess Isabella is Denmark's first domestic ferry to be powered by liquefied natural gas. Now we're leaving the, uh, the passenger area and goes down to the engine room. Using LNG instead of diesel cut the ferry CO2 emissions by 15%. The Princess Isabella cost 30 million euros. 4.5 million of that was spent on an LNG propulsion system. In a further step to reduce its carbon footprint, Samsa is exploring the possibility of fueling the ferry with locally produced biogas. The island and its 4,000 inhabitants have been carbon neutral for the past decade. The goal now is to stop using all fossil fuels. Jonathan is in a rush. The 16-year-old student believes there's little time left to save the planet. Today, he's taking part in a meeting of a school environment council. They've been asked to brainstorm ways to cut the school's CO2 footprint ahead of plans to construct a new school building. I think that we should start uh, turning off like oil plants and coal plants and stop uh, digging for oil in the ocean and we should start making more renewable energy like solar and wind powered energy. It doesn't always necessarily need to be big things. Small things in everyday life matter as well, like sorting rubbish for recycling. So I started carrying fabric bags and I realized that it's a good thing that I don't use as many plastic bags. But I th don't think it should be on an individual level. I think it should be more of a community or maybe even city or, na or a nationwide level. We could um, put it up on a platform on the internet, like YouTube, Instagram or Facebook, so like we could make people more aware that we're aware. And I think that's also why the school created this council. This school is going to build a new school. And that is going to be as eco-friendly as possible. And when we go on school trips, we can, I don't know, maybe think more of ways to transport to where we're going in more eco-friendly ways. The school is only buying food grown locally here on the island, at least as much as they can. So we don't use too much energy to import and transport all the food we eat in the school canteen from abroad to the island. For example, it's very much better for this island that we're all like riding our bikes so much, which is very good, I would say. So. Yeah, <laughs> the island's energy revolution has not gone unnoticed internationally. Each year, hundreds of so-called eco-VIPs from across the world come to the Samsa Energy Academy. We've come to meet the man behind it. Sören, nice to meet you. <laughs> this is a diesel or electric car? It's electric. 
Yeah. It's 100% electric. And here we have solar panels on the rooftop, isn't it? Yeah, we have 100 square meters of solar PV, so the house is self-sustained. Wow. We produce our own electricity yeah. in the house. And we also charge, the, the, the car is charged yeah, by yeah. the batteries. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And if I get it right, actually, this is not just a local experience, but you, you're handing it over actually to the world, your knowledge, somehow. Yeah, we have become this global icon of sustainable development. So mm. people from all over the world will come here and meet. Uh, we, next week we have the secretary of the Indonesian prime minister will be here uh, to talk about Indonesian development uh, into more sustainable uh, lifestyle and, and to make all of Indonesia sustainable. Yeah, please, Thank you. come on in. Good insulation here actually, I see. It's yeah, thick we have really insulation. Thick, yeah, it's full of paper. Paper wool, a granulated paper, so it's recircled material. So the house is kind of also demonstrating a, a kind of sustainable building material. So this is a natural house where you have like a very big uh, blanket over you <laughs> with a thick wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, Søren, in a nutshell, what the world, what Europe can learn from you from Samse? What will drive people to accept change? Well, it has to be something in it, like a what's in it for me. So can I make money? Can I save money? Can I live more sustainable? Can I change my life in a positive way? And if this is obvious for people, then change will come much faster than if it's just a, a rule or a kind of a demand from top down. Soren supported everybody to get easy access to co-ownership in the renewable infrastructures by asking the banks to provide loans. Once the wind and sun had paid back the bank, the ownership documents were handed over. Wind power is part of the solution. So you'll see more and more wind power all over the world. But with a growing scale and size of the wind turbine, you also have a growing resistance where people say, no, yeah, yeah, we not don't. in my backyard, I don't like it. No, yeah. they're too big and too ugly and they yeah. disturb the landscape. Yeah. So our take on that is that we share the ownership with people who live in the neighborhood of the wind turbines. So when you look at them, you look at your own wind turbine and not at some alien uh, aggressive investors uh, investment mm -hmm. in the project, but you look at your own installation and all of a sudden becomes nicer. It looks nicer, it sounds nicer and it has a purpose because you are part of it. Step inside. So, uh, excuse me, I'll just open the need to go to the computer. So I, I switched from remote to local uh, connection. It produces about 2.3 million kilowatt hours. So even if this is in modern scale, a small windmill, it is still a very high production. So putting off the windmill, actually, it's expensive because you will lose money. Well, <laughs> for you, <laughs> I'll do it. I mean, we, we need to stop it when we climb it. This wind turbine generates the equivalent of what 700 houses would consume in energy in a year. It's greasy, but OK. Yeah. It's an oil tank, yeah. so don't, don't slip. The vulnerable part is the gearbox because the gearbox is where the big energy is transformed into generator speed. This is a 3,000 horsepower generator. It's moving up here, I feel it actually. And I uh, mean, the future is moving as well. What to do next? The job is to repower the existing infrastructure. So these turbines will probably go down in a few years and we'll build some bigger turbines. Oh, even bigger ones? I mean, the next generation wind turbines are like three, four times bigger than this one. The, the development goes really, really fast and we need more and more energy. So there's no way around it. We have to repower the infrastructure. We have a great vision here, a great outlook. Yes. So what is your outlook for 2030? My outlook is to make this island 100% fossil free so transportation, resources and goods and everything will be included in the, in the whole equation about how to make a fossil-free community. Is there still some hope for this planet we are <laughs> living on or is it too late actually? Well, I'm an optimist and I believe that nature will help us. And if ingenuity and, and creativity is, is part of the equation, I think we'll come up with solutions.
Jorgen was one of the island's first farmers to harness solar and wind power. By reinvesting what he made from renewable energy, he made a significant profit. Jorgen. Hello. Nice to meet you. It's a great farm, actually, I see. This is your windmill over there, isn't it, this one? Yes. I have put about uh, 4 million uh, euro in the wind turbine there, the solar panels here, and I have also had a half uh, wind turbines on the sea. And so I have uh, some solar panels in Germany and Belgium and Italy. When it comes to handing out your own money from your pocket, why deciding to do so? The money was quite back, you see, in seven years. And also we don't need to buy so much oil from the Middle East and Putin and so on. And we have also the CO2 reduction. Søren convinced the local farming community to join the island's green energy revolution. Is this just about one, two, three, four, five farmers owning one of those windmills? No, for me it's, it's about uh, the ownership. The farmers own the land, but the farmers want to own windmills, but they also want to share it with the neighbors. So, I mean, this is also what you did, I mean, in, in the program. Yes, there's, uh, there's 11 wind turbines on the island and two of them are owned in shares. So I think 10% of the population on some sort, they have a part of a wind turbine. Mm -hmm. So you have it very difficult to find some people on some sort that don't like the wind turbine. <laughs> yeah. You can try. <laughs> When Samsa decided to cut its dependence on fossil fuels, one of its first moves was to get rid of generators that burn diesel. Søren is paying a visit to Arne, who manages the island's district heating system. He convinced Arne and other islanders to go for a power plant which burns straw. The CO2 emitted by the burned straw is captured by locally produced crops, creating a carbon neutral circle. There are 300 houses connected to this facility, mostly private houses, but also some hotels and restaurants. It's a water heating system with underground pipes. We send hot water heated at 80 degrees. When it returns, it's about 40 degrees, and we just heat it up again. We're heading to meet Brian, the mastermind behind the island's sustainable electricity grid. He built this windmill knowing that when it comes to energy, going green can often mean making money. Hello, nice, nice to, meet to meet you. you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. Wind energy means money because the energy that the wind creates generates cash which goes directly into the bank. It's that method the people here on Samsung have discovered. Brian is head of a European pilot project which will soon be tested in Samsa's harbour. During the summertime, hundreds of yachts anchor here, consuming huge amounts of electricity. From now on, the plan is for photovoltaic panels combined with innovative battery packs to take care of the seasonal peak time demand. Working closely with the island communities of Madeira and the Orkneys, Samsa is trying to develop a best grid solution. Each container here has 80 kilowatt hours of uh, lithium uh, battery power and uh, the PV panels here on the harbour will produce a, a day, they will produce to the batteries, they will be recharged and then in the evening the, the power consumption will come from the batteries. I'll just open here. And you can see here, each container here, there are eight containers here, and eight, eight, each container has 10 kilowatt hours of uh, battery power stored in them. Storing energy produced from wind and solar power still remains a problem. Powerful battery units like Brian's could be the answer. Today, it's only a pilot project in Samsa, but tomorrow it's hoped the concept could spread all over Denmark and beyond revolutionizing Europe's energy system. When there's windy days, we'll, we'll send out a lot of power 
back into the main grid. That's the main problem. That's why you can use big batteries to, to, to store the energy. And then when the wind is dying down, you can send it out back into the grid. So you'll have the sort of peak shaping of the production. Then you come ro home in your electric car plug it in and then you get for instance started cooking and then everything the power will come from your battery instead of from the grid and if you maybe have a lot of households doing this battery you'll have a lot more mean production of power in 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 for instance the island or maybe if you scale it up in the whole country in an effort to replicate SAMSA's model, Denmark has also announced an ambitious climate action plan. But while the island is already carbon neutral, the rest of the country is trying to get there by 2050. Selling new petrol and diesel cars could be phased out by 2030. Stefan founded the SAMSA Old Timer Auto Museum, a resting place for classic cars. Here, he tells the next generation that polluting vehicles will be one day a thing of the past. Stefan also founded SAMSA's Electric Car Drivers Association. Lobbying hard for a transport revolution on the island, he remains frustrated that ambitious targets have not been reached. We should have been at 50% electric vehicles in SAMSA by now. But it didn't happen, so that's a catastrophe. We want uh, to be a first mover on autonomous cars here in Samsø, like a test area, so we can show the world that this is the future. And by 2030, we want to get rid of all the diesel and petrol cars that we have here on the island. When I grow up, I'll drive an electric vehicle so that it doesn't pollute and is good for the environment. What's that inside? And it's cool. Wow, Stefan, thanks a lot for the music. Oh, I you're appreciate welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. It's amazing you're singing about CO2, what you're doing to change something. Yeah, well, now we're sitting in a house where uh, it's a low energy house and it only uses like uh, very little energy. I mean, my footprint on the, on the CO2 are very little now. You have to change yourself to change the world. Activists say change is also needed in public transport. Buses still run on diesel, even on Samsa. Before leaving the island, we speak to some more students. When it's built, the future school will produce its own energy via solar panels and other means and will be self-sufficient in terms of electricity consumption. Today, nine-year-old Laura is on duty in the school canteen. Even she's aware of the climatic changes taking place. It's type of bad because uh, it dries out most of the plants and the trees and the animals need it. And if we don't have the animals, then we can't have food and then <laughs> it's the end. The European Commission has targeted 2050 as the date when Europe becomes carbon neutral. That mid-century target was overwhelmingly backed by the European Parliament. But it's a non-binding resolution with member states failing to agree on a legally binding schedule. Samsø is Denmark's showcase that there is still some hope to slow down climate change and to reduce massively the CO2 footprint in just a few years' time. That's a fact. But one question remains open. If European decision makers elsewhere are able and willing to learn from SAMSO, that's not sure. Next month's European elections could be decisive in terms of whether Europe chooses to head for a safe harbour or sail into choppy waters when it comes to protecting our climate.